So Xander, I'm gonna start here if you're ready. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. This is uh, our uh, so, uh, next information session, public information session on the draft zoning bylaw. So the public has an opportunity to provide feedback and uh, questions and comments to our planners, Andrew Gopin, uh, in regards to the draft zoning bylaw. It is 6 p.m. on July uh, 20th, and we will get started here. So I will note that council members are in attendance, uh, but their job tonight is to listen to the public and hear feedback. If you have any questions to a direct counselor on a specific topic of the zoning bylaw, you may address them as well, but we would address that uh, most, and if not all questions, be provided to either myself or uh, Alexander Gopin, our planner from the Southwest Regional Service Commission. And uh, at this point, I will pass it on to Xander to give a presentation on this. And I will note that anybody who is listening on Zoom, you are muted at this point in time. After the presentation, I will go individually to each of you for any questions or comments. And then we'll go to our Facebook and we will continue this until there are no questions left. If we see that there's limited questions after about 15 minutes, we will end the meeting and take what we have as information and bring, and bring it back to council. So at this point, I will bring it off to Alexander Gopin. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen here and head into a presentation. Um, this presentation isn't going to cover every single change in the zoning bylaw. Um, it's, it's really the major changes. Um, if there's you know words here and there, I do encourage you to read the draft documents. Um, I believe there's a version uh, that has changes highlighted in it. Um, so you can see what changes have happened that way, but this is gonna be kind of big new directions for this uh, zoning bylaw. Um, so one of the potential new directions, and I should say, again, this is um, still pretty early stages of uh, um, going through council. It hasn't um, had first reading yet. Council's still really thinking about what they want to include. Um, so just because I'm presenting about it doesn't mean that it's going to be there, um, but um, as well as being big changes, these are areas that council really would like um, and myself would really like the public's feedback on. So um, don't assume that these things are necessarily going to happen, um, but if you have thoughts and feelings about them, we would definitely like to hear from you. So uh, getting into it now, short-term rentals, um, more commonly known as Airbnbs, um, but other platforms, uh, exist as well. Um, and the way that we've defined them uh, are a dwelling unit or portion thereof used as an accommodation for travelers for no more than 30 days at a time. Um, there are some confusing and convoluted definitions for things like tourist homes um, and things like tourist apartments that aren't even defined in the current zoning bylaw. So the idea with this is um, to simplify and make it clear what a short-term dwelling is, a short-term rental, sorry. Um, so yeah, remove ambiguous definitions. As well, um, one of the approaches is to uh, look at some new zones, which would be, um, unlike tourist commercial, which is an existing zone, the idea with that, it's a commercial zone. Your primary use is commercial. So uh, the Algonquin, for example, um, and even a lot of the bed and breakfasts in town, that primary use is commercial, but someone might still live there. These zones are flipping that around. So your main use would be a residential use, um, but your secondary use in these zones could be a short-term rental, although it could be a long-term rental. Uh, it could be no rentals, um, but uh, these zones are specifically for short-term rentals, although bed and breakfasts um, are also uh, allowed in this zone. So uh, they have the same standards, same other allowed uses as their, uh, what I'm calling the parent zones, the service residential zone and the state residential zone. Um, and existing bed and breakfasts and other properties that are in conformity with the current zoning bylaw could be pre-zoned, um, but new properties or properties that maybe weren't technically allowed to do uh, this type of use before would have to go through a rezoning process. 
Um, and that could include a development agreement with council, uh, which would have terms and conditions. Um, there, uh, you know, there might have to be someone there who meets guests. Um, there might be limits on uh, when outdoor gatherings can happen. Um, essentially, these would serve to um, ensure that short-term rentals uh, really fit the, because this is a residential zone do fit into residential zones and and are used in the way that people who own homes in residential zones would expect um, residences to be used and that's a little bit different from a tourist commercial zone like where the Algonquin is and um, before I uh, go on to the next slide um, this is part and I'll talk about it um, further in the presentation, but this is not a standalone thing. This is really about um, increasing the amount of affordable rental housing in the community. And there are other ways to achieve that as well, uh, but they take a little bit longer. So this would be, um, it would make running a short-term rental, it would raise the bar a little bit. So um, there would be more requirements, more regulations, if that's something you wanna do with your property. Um, and there are some other tools that council is discussing in regards to short-term rentals that wouldn't um, have to do with the zoning bylaw. Um, there, there could be other systems which involve permits and fees. Um, a lot of cities and, and even smaller communities are doing that with their short-term rentals now. Um, but the zoning is a potential as well. Um, this might seem like a minor thing, um, but it, it could have a fairly large impact on um, what heights are allowed in town. So there's, there's different ways to define height in zoning bylaws. And in St. Andrews, height has always been defined as the peak of a building. So the highest point, there are some exep exemptions like church steeples, um, you know, radio antenna, um, chimneys, um, but, in general, it's been to the peak. Now, a lot of places are starting to focus on the visual impact of the roof line rather than what is the actual highest point. Um, so you can see here where the midpoint is in different types of roof styles. Um, and each of these roofs has, um, you could argue a different visual impact if you're viewing it head on. Um, so the amount of kind of space it takes up in the in the air is different. Um, now, there there is the potential um, that someone could say, "I'm going to build the the highest A-frame possible um, that will be all roof, and so I'll get to go even higher." Um, you can have a maximum peak still, which would be higher than the currently allowed um, height <laughs> definition, but um, would stop any kind of uh, slippery slopes or um, people trying to take advantage of it. And another reason for this besides just thinking about the visual impact rather than the overall height is um, the modern building standards that um, architects like to use these days, they're, uh, especially when, when a developer has the finances to do it, they wanna go above and beyond code. Um, code, building code has a certain height limit for, for roofs and ceilings, um, but if you're a taller person, uh, that might start to feel a little bit cramped, and the general trends and styles these days are to have um, fairly high ceilings and, um, you know, create airy, light spaces. Um, so we've, uh, this would also probably cut down on the amount of height variances that would occur. And um, again, in illustrating this, uh, trying to visualize it, um, under the new definition, all of these buildings would be considered 12 and a half meters in height, um, which uh, is looking like it would be the maximum allowed height in the historic business district. That's still up in the air, but I just wanted to pick a number um, so you could see how it works across different roof lines. Um, so this was, again, something that council really wanted uh, public feedback on and is certainly um, not necessarily going to be the way height is defined. It might stay at peak, um, but it's it's in the mix. So something to think about. And this is, this is what I was talking about in terms of uh, increasing affordable rental options and, and even um, 
maybe some smaller uh, resale homes. Um, so the background of this and something that's addressed in the municipal plan is um, those, those of you who know, and most people in St. Andrews do know that it's a very tough rental market. Um, it's very hard to find rental housing, especially that's affordable. And that um, creates certain limits in town and um, it creates challenges for employers. It creates challenges for uh, residents, of course. Um, and, and overall that can create um, some challenges for the town. So working to increase residential options, yes, um, regulating the short-term rentals a little bit more would be one way to do that. But there are other ways as well. Um, so before in the, or now I suppose in the current bylaw, um, you, you couldn't, there, there are some, which, which I guess would be grandfathered in, but you weren't allowed to have a garden suite. So that's like a little, uh, one room, very small, like under 600 square feet. Um, you know, a little, uh, tiny home, I suppose you could call it a tiny home. Um, and, uh, those are things that a lot of municipalities are saying these can totally fit into the character of town. Um, they can increase. Uh, the residential options, they would be much cheaper. Um, they might be really great options for uh, seniors, people who want to maybe be near other people, but not necessarily living in the same home as them. Could be really good for students as well. Um, and then there's a few other uh, accessory dwelling units. Um, so there's in what are called in-law suites, which are inside the home and then basement apartments. And those, those have been um, generally allowed. Uh, so those aren't necessarily new, but the garden suites in residential zones, that's a new thing. Um, and this is just an example of what they could look like. Uh, and again, they would be a secondary use. Uh, um, so you would still have to have a main residential use, but then um, assuming you have that, uh, and you're still going to be limited by the number of buildings on a lot. Um, but you could certainly have a home and one of these, uh, potentially a home garage and one of these. Uh, depends a little bit on the zone. Another way to increase rental options, um, currently duplexes are allowed in the service residential zone and MR1, um, but there are ways to design uh, triplexes um, that can very, very much fit into the character of St. Andrews, um, can you know, look almost identical to a duplex or even a single family home uh, if the entrances are all inside, which would be a requirement. Um, and you're adding one, one more unit. Every time you build one of these, you're adding one more unit than you previously could. Um, but again, uh, you know, you want them to look good and fit into the character. That's one of the reasons why we think the secondary plan is very important. There needs to be um, a way to do that. Um, so those of you who have been tuning to the secondary plan, um, that's essentially the design manual. Uh, and again, limiting the outdoor entrances, um, that will make a home look more like it fits in. It won't look uh, kind of haphazard with staircases going up and uh, on the outside and doors everywhere. Um, but those are very simple design um, tools. As well, we've identified an area on the map, uh, a residential growth area. You'll see where that is um, when I get to the zoning map. And uh, that's an area uh, mostly owned by the town um, near the subdivision, which uh, has a lot of potential for um, apartment buildings, um, smaller homes, uh, potentially even, um, I just learned about this idea called pocket neighborhoods of, so neighborhoods just of tiny homes. Um, there's a lot of potential and um, the town did a really good job developing the subdivision when that happened. Uh, and they were trying to increase affordable housing options, slightly different market than um, people looking to buy single family homes. It's a little bit less where the market is now, um, but definitely still uh, the town can be involved in developing more housing. Moving on to step back from the ordinary high water mark. Um, so currently, there is a prohibition on development within 20 meters of the ordinary high water mark. Um, it's, it's a little strange in the zoning bylaw. In uh, some places, it may be 20 feet, although that may be a typo. Um, so currently, uh, basically, if you're in the downtown, like historic business district, 
Um, historically, people have developed pretty much to the water's edge. And what we're proposing is to extend that from 20 meters to 30 meters everywhere. Uh, so downtown, estate, you know, the state residential areas, um, moving out towards um, the rest of the peninsula. Um, but the difference is it removes the prohibition. So it allows for limited development. It sets standards for that development. Um, whereas with the 20 meter prohibition, that's a prohibition. And if you really want to build there, you have to get a variance. So what this would mean is that there are some private residential properties which are uh, zoned as green space right now. Um, and with this, because it's a, uh, extends around the whole coastline, it is 30 meters from the coastline wherever you are, um, it doesn't need to be mapped in the same way. So those, if you're in a state residential zone and you currently have green space uh, in that kind of buffer between your property and the coast, um, although that is the green space is uh, most likely your property too. They appear as different zones. So now what happened is it'll all be one zone. So it would just be a state residential, but in that 30 meters, there would be some different standards. And those are based on best practices, things like the St. Croix Corridor Regulation, um, the Coastal Air Protection Policy that the province uh, provides as a best practice for coastal development. Um, and so it can allow for low impact responsible development that does not negatively impact the environment or aesthetics. Um, so it would allow a lot of accessory buildings, things like gazebos, uh, shore works, um, you know, if you wanna build uh, some kind of staircase and deck down to the shore, um, those things would all uh, essentially be allowed. But if you want to build uh, <clears throat> habitable spaces, so, you know, places where people are living, sleeping, um, over 600 square feet, then you would require an environmental plan um, that deals with erosion and runoff. And uh, depending on where you are in town, there might be issues with sea level rise as well. It would also limit tree clearing because um, tree clearing speeds up erosion. And um, it also affects the aesthetics of town. Now, St. Andrews has not just one aesthetic. Um, there's kind of the downtown Water Street, uh, I like to call the Maritime Village. Um, and then as you get out more into the outskirts of town, it does feel more like estate, large estate properties, um, which are um, maybe a little bit more natural in their setting. Um, so this wouldn't, uh, you know, if you're, if you're downtown, your property's clear, you're not required to plant trees. Um, it just means that um, likely the properties that haven't been developed, their tree clearing would be limited. Also, no septic systems in this area. Um, septic runoff going into the water is not good. Uh, I think that's pretty explanatory. Um, and this, while it wouldn't be mapped on the zoning map, I did want to show where this would apply. And I especially wanted to show um, the downtown and water street um, because when you look at this, you realize, well, yeah, people have developed to the water's edge, but it is all developed. Um, I don't, there might be one or two infill properties on the south side of Water Street on the water side. Um, but I think one of the major ones uh, they've already started work on. Um, so I don't believe that this would really affect any new development on Water Street and would, um, but it would still apply equally and fairly to the whole coastline. Uh, so chickens, um, you know, we've heard various things about chickens. Um, some people really want chickens, some people really don't. Um, but other municipalities in New Brunswick and uh, really around the world uh, do allow urban chickens. And um, as far as I know, none of them have rolled that back. Uh, so, the way we've crafted this um, in the SR and ER zones, chickens would be allowed, but there's quite a few conditions that go along with that, which mean not every property would be able to have them. There are certain size requirements. Um, you can't start a commercial operation with your chickens. Only female chickens, which are generally quiet, they just kind of peck and maybe cluck a little bit, whereas the roosters are crowing. Um, so no roosters, which because those are the ones that really make the noise. Uh, the maximum number of chickens is four per lot. 
They must be fenced during the day and cooped at night so that they're not out running around. Don't need chickens crossing roads. Um, and then the coop must be in the rear yard, 10 meters from rear and side lot lines. Uh, and just really like with a lot of unsightly properties, you know, if this leads to unsightliness, then that's um, an enforceable matter. So uh, one of the counselors when I was presenting this before asked which properties would this apply to? What properties would be allowed to have chickens with this new policy? Um, so I put together what is now my favorite map. It's the chicken map for St. Andrews. Um, and this is, a, please note the disclaimer there. This is for general planning purposes. I wasn't out measuring yards. Um, this was just done with software and um, you know, trying to get a general sense of this. Urban chickens are not currently allowed. Uh, and if you do want chickens, again, you're going to need a development permit, at least for the coop. So just because your property is green on here does not mean you can go out and get chickens. Just want to make that very clear. Um, but uh, I think this gives you a sense of, you know, you can see some properties in the town plat are large enough, have large enough backyards. Um, the orange ones here are kind of maybes. Um, and then when you get into the estate residential, uh, most of those properties would be able to have chickens. But again, those are much larger lots. Um, so this is, if you're wondering uh, about who would be able to have chickens um, and, and maybe you want them and you're not on here, so you want small requirements or you don't want them next to you, but your neighbor's property is on here, you want larger requirements. Um, it, this should help you give a sense of how this would affect you a little bit more individually. But again, without roosters, um, with properly managed chickens, um, even if you're next to a coop, it, it should be something you notice uh, pretty minimally. So another uh, map to show you is the sea level rise overlay zone. Um, and this is different from the 30 meter setback. Um, that allows certain things and is mostly dealing with uh, aesthetics and erosion. Um, the sea level rise overlay zone is, does not apply everywhere. Um, it's, it's very specific to areas that are predicted to um, experience uh, flooding from sea level rise and from storm surges, um, looking ahead to 2050, 2100. And, and again, the zone is not terribly uh, prevalent. Um, you do have a little bit of Patrick Street, um, a little bit of the point. Um, but again, it's not, uh, again, St. Andrews is fairly lucky in terms of sea level rise. Um, compared to places like the Acadian Peninsula, which is going to lose lots and lots of land, both to the water coming up and the land washing away. Um, so this is below 4.4 meters, and it wouldn't completely prohibit development, but you would have to sign waivers um, and not have any uh, habitable spaces where people are sleeping, um, mechanical equipment or electrical equipment below that 4.4 uh, meter elevation. So some other changes, none of which are large enough to get their own slides. Um, in the current zoning bylaw, utility uses are public and private. There's no distinction between them. Um, and uh, we feel that it's important to distinguish between those. You know, um, what NB Power is doing is very different from um, someone might decide they want to set up a radio antenna and broadcast pirate radio or something like that. Um, those are very different uses. Also looking at standards for bicycle parking. Um, the town is working on a transportation master plan. And I believe after my presentation, you're gonna hear from uh, someone from the Coastal Link Trail who's gonna talk about cycling in town. Um, so as more and more people are cycling and that's, that's a really great development and St. Andrews is a wonderful town to bicycle in, especially with the Van Horn Trail. Um, bicycle parking is going to be more and more important. You have standards for car parking. Um, bicycle parking is much easier to install, um, but this just adds standards for if you have certain types of business outside of uh, the downtown where there's you know, lots of signposts. I think the town installs some larger racks uh, kind of the beginning and end of that strip. Um, but if you have businesses outside of there, um, there would be, you know, you have to put up a, a post for every um, car parking spot you have. 
of one space for every 20 cars, uh, but at least two. So, um, and uh, residential uses in the historic business district are exempt. I seem to be ahead of my presentation tonight a little bit. My apologies. Um, another change. Uh, so the mixed use zone, um, it is basically an extension of, uh, it extends out from the central commercial zone um, along Water Street and uh, going uh, into some of the blocks um, up from Water Street a little bit. And the standards have always been um, whatever use you're doing. So let's say you're doing an institutional use, you have to meet the requirements of the institutional zone, um, which is generally much larger properties, um, things like the Huntsman. Um, and given that all of these properties are uh, I think most, the majority of them are residential properties in the town plat. Um, it makes sense to have those same lot standards in terms of setbacks um, and, uh, you know, maximum lot coverage, things like that. Um, now, that being said, um, in discussions with council, uh, it looks like there are some uses, um, specifically the institutional, Tourist commercial uses, which are allowed in the mixed use zone, but might um, be slightly more intensive. And so council is considering those uses in the mixed use zone, uh, either being subject to terms and conditions um, or uh, potentially other standards so that um, the mixed use zone becomes primarily a residential zone, which in terms of land use, it really is. Another uh, change, which is um, functionally not that large, although technically it seems like a big change. So section nine of the current zoning bylaw regulates development in the town plot and historic business district. Um, we're proposing taking that out and moving a few of those to more appropriate section. Uh, so it deals with parking lot standards um, and, and some other lot standards as well that, that can just go into those zones, um, but with, you know, knowing that this is what you do if you're in this zone in the historic business district. But there are a lot of those things that we have replaced with, uh, or are proposing to replace with the secondary plan and design manual. Um, and I don't, I won't go too into that document because we're here to talk about the zoning bylaw and there's uh, other opportunities to discuss that document, um, but it, that document has a lot of best practices in it as well as requirements. And the requirements are very, very similar to section nine. The best practices do go above and beyond that, um, but they are best practices and not required. And the hope is over time, um, those standards do get raised um, and, and lots of people do decide to go with the best practices. Um, another uh, thing to mention is there's, been some controversy over flag signs. Uh, they are not technically allowed in the current zoning bylaw, so your open flag or what have you. Um, but they were allowed at one point, and many businesses became businesses when they were allowed. So they're allowed to have them still. And then new businesses come in and want to have flag signs, but they're not allowed, even though every other business going down the street has a flag. So um, what we're proposing is to allow sign flags uh, as a form of um, projecting sign or, or a, a standalone sign like a sandwich board. Um, so it would be limited in the number of those standalone signs you could have um, so that sidewalks don't become cluttered with um, overhanging flags and, and sandwich boards and things like that. But um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to prohibit flag signs when so many people have them. Another uh, change is, is kind of like the residential growth area. Um, we're also proposing an institutional growth area and that's really just for the Huntsman. And um, we've been in discussions with them about some of their future plans. And um, there's a lot of potential for that land and a lot of it is undeveloped. So uh, putting it in the zoning map um, means that uh, because this is such 
a critical property and if it's developed in the right way could do so much for the town. It gives the town um, a little bit more, um, I would say both control, but also incentive to partner with uh, the Huntsman to figure out um, how to develop a, um, could be a knowledge park, something like that. Um, that's what's always been thrown around, but there's other potential um, projects there as well. So uh, this is the new or proposed uh, new zoning map. Um, there, there might be one or two changes still coming, um, but in general, this is what it would look like. And you'll note that the green space is no longer around the, uh, well, it never really went into the downtown, um, but it's not around the rest of town anymore. And uh, you can see there are some new zones as well, the SRT zone and the ERT zone, wherever that is. Um, and uh, I believe there's a copy of this map in the town office um, as well as on the website. So if you want to see it blown up, um, there's two options for you. And that is the end of my presentation. So uh, as Paul said, I am uh, more than happy to take questions from the audience. I'll do my best to answer them. And I'll just say one more time, you know, we're in early um, stages with this zoning bylaw. It is largely drafted, but really hasn't begun to move through council um, aside from discussions. So I'll leave it there and uh, take any questions that you have for me. Perfect. Thank you, Xander, for your presentation. It was very thorough, and uh, I think it gave a good overview of what's, what the changes are for the zoning bylaw for the community. I will note um, for anybody on Facebook, uh, you can post your questions and comments to uh, the comment section. Uh, please specifically targeting the draft zoning bylaw tonight uh, for this meeting. Uh, we will go to the Zoom people first and we'll ask them if they have any questions or comments for Xander and then we'll go to the comments on Facebook as there is a little bit of a time lag. So I'm going to start with Vic Miller. I'm going to unmute you or ask to unmute you Vic if you have any questions, comments uh, that you'd like to present to Xander Gopin, our planner, you've got the floor. Vic, do you have any questions? As I'm getting no response, we'll come back to Vic in a minute. I will go to Brian. Brian, I'm uh, asking you if you've got any questions or comments for Xander. No, I'm great. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Brian. I'll go to Sheila Washburn. Sheila, do you have any questions or comments for Xander Gopin? Give it a minute to you and unmute. I'm Sheila, fine. Thank you. Great. Thank I have you. no questions. Thank you very much. As, uh, as I'm not sure what's going on. Give me one second, Council. Uh, at this point, I will go to Facebook, and I only have a an emoji photo that came up. Uh, I believe this came up during uh, our discussions with the uh, chickens. It's a smiley, laughy emoji with the map. But I see that Vic Miller is uh, back here. So I'll see Vic, do you have any questions for council? Vic appears in two screens here, so. At this, at this point, I'm not seeing any questions coming from there. Um, council, do you have any questions for Xander? No, I'm fine, thanks. I, uh, Council, I do have, and Xander, I do have somebody on the line. It's a 1801 number. You have the floor to uh, Xander Gopin and the Council if you have any questions or comments on the draft zoning bylaw. Can you please state your full name? Oh, hi, it's Lindy Townsend. Listen, I just tuned in, so I'm not sure if my question is relevant. I'm also going to attend the meeting at 7 o'clock. Um, this was for the draft zoning bylaws, and your first reading was last week. Am I correct? Uh, uh, Lindy, uh, we actually haven't had a reading yet. Uh, Council has had two workshops on the draft zoning bylaw, 
and this is the okay. latest public information session. We're looking to go to first reading at the end of July here. Okay, so um, my, my question would be this. Wouldn't it be prudent if we could see the draft zoning bylaw along with um, the municipal plan in order to see those and compare those two uh, items against each other? Is that the intention of council? Uh, through you, your mayor, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, certainly. Th that is certainly possible. Both of those documents are available at, at this point in time. We would really appreciate it, our group. If um, I know you've heard our concerns, and I thank you, your worship and town council, but we would really like to compare those two documents. We feel like we made a lot of headway, and um, we feel like... Um, you know, we our concerns were heard, but I think just in order to make sure, and it's not that we want to pick holes in it, um, but just kind of have the opportunity for those two to be rolled out together since that was the intention um, all along. So if if those are happening at the same time, we would very much appreciate if we could look at both items, just double check. We've been very happy with the process with Xander and Alex, um, and we would very much appreciate if we could compare the two items just before we, as our group, and I'm sure the other rate payers can kind of say, yes, it looks like two good work products that work side by side. Okay, Mr. Knopper, I'm sure that can be accomplished, can it not? Uh, through you, Your Worship, if Xander is okay, I can look to schedule another public information session where we talk about both documents uh, before we have the public hearing of objection for the zoning bylaw. Would that suffice? Xander? Oh, um, yeah, I think it would. I mean, I'm happy to do that. Um, but again, I think also, uh, I believe all of the documents are online on the town website. So, um, I, I imagine uh, Ms. Townsend would like to go through it fairly detailed, and that's not something I really am able to do in a presentation. So um, I would encourage her and anyone else who wants to look at how they work together um, to uh, go to the town's website. And um, I, th I think it's pretty clear where they are. I know Paul's done a lot of work to make it clear. Um, so I, I definitely encourage you. Yeah, yes, I'm happy to present them together. Um, but I think uh, for some people, they, they will be better off going through them themselves, uh, really reading word by word. Xander, okay, as long as they're available, yeah. as, as long as they're available side by side simultaneously, and of course, we don't expect you to do the tedious um, job of going through line upon line, precept to pre upon precept, we'll do that in our group. But we would very much, since these are draft, since these are draft zoning bylaws, and this is really working sessions. Once the sort of final product, work product, is done on the municipal plan and the zoning bylaws, that's what we'd like to compare. So, how close are we to having the zoning bylaws in that sort of final? work product so we can compare it against the municipal plan. Uh, Xander, I can field that right now. So currently the municipal plan is at second reading, uh, going to a public hearing of objections next week uh, on the 27th. So this will be the third public hearing of objections to that document. So it's we're hoping that's in its final stages. The zoning document is in its initial stages going for first reading. So uh, in the process, uh, one's going to be more drafted than the other, but the municipal plan will lead uh, how the direction and uh, the continued direction goes for the zoning bylaw. So whatever is passed in the municipal plan will have to be reflected in the zoning bylaw. And so is it possible that those both get sort of confirmed or ratified at the exact same time since they're both in, in sort of that draft? final stage like does it hurt anything if that was the case 
uh, through you, Your Worship, um, and to, to Xander, uh, I don't think there's any issue with holding the municipal plan over till third reading of the draft zoning bylaw. Is there any, do you feel that there's any time issue within those constraints? No, I don't feel like that would be an issue. Um, now the municipal plan is kind of the, in the hierarchy of, of planning documents, it's the highest plan. Um, so the zoning bylaw couldn't, even if the municipal plan was passed before, uh, the zoning bylaw can't contradict it. Um, but I don't, besides the, you know, the fact that this has been going on for a while, and I think we'd like to see some, um, something get passed, uh, there's no reason to, um, speed up to pass one before the other. Through you, Your Worship, Does it, do you have any issues if there was uh, a look at merging all the documents to pass at the same time? I think that's something that maybe we could discuss next week when, with all of council present to see if anybody else on council has an issue with that. I don't think so based on the good advice of our planner that it wouldn't cause any uh, difficulty other than a delay in passing the uh, municipal plan. Thank you, Your Worship. Lindy, do you have any other questions? No, I would really appreciate if that could be done. And again, we won't, because we'll do all the work in the background, if they get passed at the same time on their, on the last sort of read through on the third reading and then it's passed, it, I think it'll expedite things for everybody and there will be less headaches. All right. But that's uh, it. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you, Thank you Lindy. very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to put you on mute now, Lindy. I'm going to go back to Vic Miller uh, to see if Vic's got any. Vic, do you have any questions or concerns or comments for council in regards to the draft zoning bylaw? I know they uh, they look like you've done your homework on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mick. Uh, and council at this moment, I still do not see any further comment on uh, on the uh, Facebook social media here um so we have a couple of options we are i'm uh, frozen again yeah you froze again there Guy. um not sure what's happening with you um but we are about 20 minutes to the next meeting so council i'm willing to leave it open for another five minutes if there anybody else has got any questions or comments if not uh we can close the meeting from there and uh get ready for the next one uh do uh Mayor Nace, do you have any issue with that no, that's fine, uh, Mr. Knopper. Uh, Your Worship, uh, is this uh, is this an appropriate time for councillors to comment, or are we just collecting public feedback since we have some time? You're, you're we're waiting. collecting public feedback, but if there's something that's that's pressing, that's relevant. Well, I had a few comments. Uh, some of them I've, I've stated before, but just to reiterate. Um, is this an appropriate time or? Go ahead, Mr. Gumashaw. Okay, well, thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, with regard to regulations on short-term rentals, I, I think we can uh, adequately uh, regulate short-term rentals using fees. I don't think we, uh, we need to get into all of the, the uh, nitty gritty of what's what with regard to short-term rentals beyond we could regulate that whole thing by just charging fees, in my opinion. Um, I, I like uh, Xander's uh, hard work in uh, densifying our town, making it easier to bring more people to live in uh, a small space. So that word densification, I think we came up with before, or it's already a word someone else invented, but uh, densification. So more people living in our, our little town would be a, a good thing for growth. Um, we can do that uh, using some of the, some of the uh, thoughtful and uh, tasteful things uh, that uh, Xander has brought forward, especially like with garden suites and uh, uh, packing more people into the, the same uh, space. Uh, I also agree with uh, Xander's comment in uh, plotting the former uh, town staff back in the day for having the vision to build the uh, subdivision. I think the town would be a very different place if we didn't currently have the subdivision. And I think we should be looking at, uh, at uh, other available space to uh, continue in that, that same vein. Uh, putting in services, making it easy for people to move here. Um, also uh, following Xander's uh, vision with regard to uh, current industry trends, 
um, that applies to chickens. Uh, good job on the chicken map uh, and hopefully uh, encouraging lots of people from uh, more urban centers to uh, consider coming to St. Andrews and making it home when uh, we're doing similar things to what they're doing in, in larger cities, uh, like for chickens are big in Vancouver, for example. Um, with regard to changing the zoning on people's properties, I think that that's a process that needs uh, people whose zoning is going to change. They need ample written notification, maybe a phone call, and then a follow up discussion and education as to when we're changing it, even if it's a slight change on their zoning, people immediately get upset. And uh, if we, um, we can probably uh, um, get around a lot of that uh, initial frustration by reaching out to people whose zoning may be changing. Um, with regard to the sign flags, uh, I've said before, I'm very opposed to uh, these open sign flags. Um, I mean, <clears throat> if you have an open sign flag, want to have a closed sign flag, what could, what other sorts of sign flags could you have? Is, are we going to regulate that as well? I've said in the past that uh, um, there seems to be a tradition in St. Andrews that if you're open, you put out a, you put out a Canada flag or a New Brunswick flag and, and that's it and uh, all the other open da 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 are kind of tacky. Uh, just a couple more points since we have all this time. Um, I like the incentive to partner with Huntsman through zoning and to encourage smokeless development out at the Huntsman. I think that's very proactive. And uh, uh, finally, um, with regard to uh, partners, I'm curious if we have engaged our, another major partner would being the Algonquin on their plans with uh, their properties around town uh, adjacent to the golf course and, and different places uh, to, sit, to save both them and future uh, councils um, the trouble of having to rezone after our this current bylaw is passed. Finally, thank you to Xander for all your hard work, vision, and leadership during this arduous process. Those are my comments, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Councilor Michelle. Uh, we do have a little bit of time, but uh, if anybody else who's sitting in, not all councillors are present, but uh, if anyone else on council has a comment for a couple of minutes and we'll, uh, we'll adjourn to uh, re restart the second part of the meeting, the second meeting. I so move. Okay. <laughs> all right, Mr. Knopper, unless we have anybody else who's been waiting to get in, uh, we'll, uh, we'll carry on and Okay, well, well, then we'll finish off the meeting here. So I want to thank all of the public for participation tonight uh, via Zoom and Facebook. If you have any additional comments, questions, or concerns, please do not hesitate to contact the town office here uh, in writing or by phone or email. We're glad to forward on your questions or comments to our planners, or if we can answer them on their behalf, we will. So please don't hesitate. This is a great opportunity to, to learn about the zoning bylaws and, and what's going to be happening within your community. So. Uh, we will adjourn for this point at 6.48 on the July 20th. And thank you everyone for participating. Uh, we're going to end the meeting and go to our next one. Council, I'll remind you that we do have a second link to this meet to the next meeting. So it'll be a whole new meeting. So please follow that and I'll be in it in a couple of minutes. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks, Paul. See you next week. <laughs> See you next week.